Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Hope you're doing well, inshallah. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to continue with our uh, reading of the book um, by William Dalrymple, The Anarchy and the Relentless Rise of the East India Company. So we're moving on and we're into chapter number five, Bloodshed and Confusion. But before we get into that chapter, um, I just want to remind uh, people who are watching where we're up to. So there were two rival governments uh, which were basically running the uh, Bengal, which was a very prosperous uh, place. There was the East India Company and there was also the uh, the Nawab there. Uh, Mir Jafar, if you like, or Mir Qasim, what's his name? So, over the next two years, between 1761 and 1762, relationship between both of them became very, very hostile. Uh, and the reason this was was that the way the private company uh, increasingly became rapacious, it became very, very greedy, and it began to abuse its privileges uh, to penetrate uh, the Bengali economy and to undermine Mir Qasim's rule, right? He'd been now the Nawab there as well. Um, and he became quite paranoid, Mir Qasim, with someone called William Ellis. He was one of the chief uh, factors, the one who runs the factory uh, in Patna, in a place called Patna. And he was also actively forming a rebellion uh, against him as well. Um, so Mir Qasim wasn't happy with the way with the way the company was behaving. He made approaches with Hastings um, to say, "Look, can you do something about this? Right, the company is too aggressive, and you need to uh, rein it in." And he actually said as well, uh, "I quote: If our people, instead of erecting themselves into lords and oppressors of the country, confine themselves to an honest and fair trade, they will everywhere be courted and respected." This is what Hastings said. Um, then in early February 1762, um, he basically took it upon himself to arrest and imprison uh, in the English factory a senior Armenian official official of Mir Qasim, whose name was Khaja Antun. So this was really the straw that broke the camel's back. Okay, And then Mir Qasim writes again that uh, to Warren Hastings uh, that... In this way, your gentlemen behave. They made they make a disturbance uh, all over my country, plunder their people, injure and disgrace my servants with a resolution to expose my government to content and make it their business to expose me to scorn. Setting up their colors and showing company passes, they use their utmost endeavors to oppress the peasant farmers, merchants and other people of the country. They forcibly take away the goods and commodities of the merchants for a fourth part of their value. And by way of violence and oppression, they oblige the farmers to give 50 rupees for goods that are worth but, but one. Okay, and then he continues talking about this. He says, near, near, near four or five hundred new private English factories have been established in my dominions. My officers, in, my officers in every district have desisted from the exercise of their functions so by means of these oppressions and by my being deprived of my custom duties. I suffer a yearly loss of nearly 25 lakh rupees. In that case, how can I keep clear up my debts? How can I provide for the payment of my army and my household? In this case, how can I perform my duties? And how can I send the emperor uh, his due from Bengal? So um, so they tried uh, Hastings and a few others tried to resolve this crisis. Um, um, and Hastings was actually very critical of Ellis, who was just basically pillaging a Bengal, William Ellis, as well. And um, that this wasn't the right thing to do as well. And so it was reflected later on that the English would have avoided great most, most misfortunes when they broke with the Nawab, had they but followed the wise counsel of Mr. Hastings. Mr. Hastings was trying to bring parties together. But a few bankrupt and dissipated English councillors who had gotten themselves into debt and were determined to rebuild their personal fortunes at whatever public cost, pursued their ambitions and caused a war. So it was really this greed that fomented, uh, um, that, that fomented these wars. Uh, in December 1762, um, just as um, Mir Qasim made a move, a political move, he had had enough with Ellis's violence after two years, and he decided 
that it was time to fight back and resist the encroachments of the company. So he decided basically to uh, make a stand. Mir Qasim decided to make a stance against Alice as well. So in March 1763, army um, a clash broke out between uh, Mir Qasim's men and those of the company. Um, there were in there were scuffles in various places. Um, and there was a, a fight that broke out as well. Um, they began to fight amongst each other. Um, and then at the same time, uh, Ellis decided to hatch his plan to seize Patna by force. So he'd been in a factory. Now he decided he wanted to take Patna by force. Um, and he's, he wasn't listening to Hastings and his men anymore in terms of restraining uh, what they felt were all the excesses of the company. And he also decided to take things into his own hands. Um, and so Ellis um, realized that war was the option here. Yeah? Um, and he decided to make the first strike by possessing uh, the city of Patna. Okay. And the, this was a place where they planned the insurrection against Mughal rule. What, and, and this is where they were going to really take on the Nawab. And it was actually the same place where they earlier had offered their loyalty or fealty even to Shah Alam only 18 months earlier. So he now decided, Ellis would now, has now decided that he's going to take Patna by force from them. Okay. And the gates swung open and Ellis marched with his sepoys out of the compound and began his assault on the sleeping city of Patna. Mm -hmm. And the company and the Mughals were now at war, right, once again. And so they blew the gates open and stormed into the old Mughal fort in Patna. Uh, the governor there had to escape as well. And the English now had the city of Patna in their control. Okay. And then they set about plundering goods from the shops, dispersing across the city, pillaging the homes of innocent citizens. Okay. Um, there was no opposition. The city was uh, basically free. Uh, Ellis gave permission to his men to sack the city, um, in which their courage turned into avarice, and every one of them thought of nothing but skulking off with whatever they could get hold of as well. And unknown to the company, however, just three miles, however, beyond Patna, fleeing governor, the fleeing governor ran into a large body of reinforcements consisting of four platoons, uh, four platoons of Mir Qasim's new army. So they, were, they, they had to flee, um, but they, they, they were able to re regroup. Um, the English fell back towards their fat, uh, factory, so they left Patna, uh, they pillaged it, uh, as was their custom, and they left uh, Patna in, in a very devastated uh, state um, and they were the, um, the way they made back Mir Qasim was also able to take back um, Patna uh, as well um, but Mir Qasim was also enraged so he wrote to Calcutta company complaining that Ellis like a night robber assaulted the Qila of Patna robbed and plundered the bazaar and all the merchants and inhabitants ravaging and slaying from morning to the afternoon, afternoon, right? And he continues, you gentlemen must, must answer for the injury which the company's affairs have suffered. And since you have cruel, cruelly and unjustly ravaged the city and destroyed its people and plundered to the value of hundreds and thousands of rupees, it becomes the justice of the company to make reparation for the poor as was formerly done for Calcutta after it's sacked by Siraj Daula. So he's basically saying, look, you guys pillage this place. You guys need to pay for it. Um, but it's too late for that um, because there was no going back. Um, even uh, the Mughal elites were rising against, uh, rising up against the English, and um, behind Mir Qasim. So people were just fed up, and people were at, at this stage uh, thinking about or if, uh, looking at taking back um, uh, what was rightfully theirs. And so Mir Qasim became sort of like a person that was very, very interested. Uh, interesting in in this situation. In July 1763, uh, the council in Calcutta, so who to whom Mir Qasim had written to, in terms of complaining about the uh, excesses of Ellis, um, they decided rather to engage and actually declare war on Mir Qasim. Okay, and in fact, what they also did was they went a, a bit further, and they voted to put back on the throne his elderly father-in-law, the former Nawab Mir Jafar. So they decided we don't want Mir Qasim anymore, someone that we put there. We want to replace him with Mir Jaffa. Um, and he was actually an opium addict by then. 
and and he wasn't really uh, the right person to rule. But that wasn't really the point. The point was to have a puppet ruler that would serve their interests. Um, and he also said, if you put me there, I'll reimburse you with um, money, uh, which is about sixty-five million pounds today, um, and for the expense of fighting uh, his ambitious son-in-law. So the father-in-law and son-in-law are being used by the East India Company for their own ends. Um, and so making war against the Nawab, the East India Company, uh, against a person that they personally installed themselves only five years er earlier, uh, was a bit of an embarrassment for the company. You know, we put this person in to serve our interests, and that's not quite working out the way uh, we wanted it to. Um, there was military campaigns launched against Mir Qasim, but they were very, very slow. They weren't very as successful, as rapid uh, as they'd wanted. There was a number of battles and skirmishes between Mir Qasim and Mir Jafar and the East India Company as well. Um, and so the, um, the, uh, there was, in the end, there was a battle where um, where a number of uh, uh, people were killed. Um, for example, he says 15,000 men met their end in one battle. And so there was quite a lot of battle as well. Uh, Mir Qasim was defeated and, um, and he became obsessed with this idea uh, because obviously he, he'd been losing a lot of um, influence. And obviously his son-in-law, Mir Jafar, had been made the uh, Nawab or who was being made the Nawab by the British or the English. Um, so he became obsessed with the idea that he had been betrayed and that his own commanders were working against him. Um, and this was to do with uh, a place where he'd con constructed a fort and the English had found a back route in and destroyed and attacked his army. And he felt that um, it was someone who told him about this, which wasn't really true. Um, but in any case, um, he had already tended to vicious cruelty, as we know. But now as a star of his um, good fortune faded, um, and cracks began to appear in his governance, he pushed even further down the path of brutality. And then he focused on certain people because he was now really in a state of paranoia. Um, so, for example, he ordered the assassination of Gurgin Khan, uh, who was his most loyal commander. So he got rid of his commander. And then he went after someone called uh, Raja Ram Narain, who was a former governor of Patna and who had fought so bravely against Shah Alam someone who really helped him um, and he was also from a Hindu community who served the Mughals as administrators so they'd been very loyal to the Mughal Empire and who often used to send their children uh, for a Persianite madrasa education so that's very very interesting as well so they were Hindus but they would receive madrasa education as well um, and Ram Narain had also grown up loving poetry and had been one of the most one of the students of Sheikh Muhammad Ali Hazin of Isfahan Arguably, the author say the greatest Persian poet of the 18th century, okay, uh, and who moved to as an exile to Benares, realizing that his execution was imminent. Ram Narain wrote the last series of couplets, which I want to share with you, in the style of his uh, ustad, his teacher. Uh, these verses of sadness and resignation were once famous in the region. Enough, my life flickers away. A solitary candle flames from its head. Waxy tears flow down its skirts. Uh, your flirtatious beauty, my dark days, all will pass. A king's dawn, a pauper's evening, all will pass. The garden's visitor, the laughing rosebud, both are fleeting. Grief and joy will pass, all will pass. Uh, so after he wrote these verses, uh, he was actually killed. Um, then after that, uh, as if that wasn't enough, Mir Qasim went for his financiers, the Jagat Sets, right? We've talked about them before. Um, so when Ellis and his companions were arrested, Mir Qasim had carefully examined. Um, so when when he when he'd taken uh, when he invaded and taken uh, back and he'd captured with Ellis, he'd found some letters where Ellis was uh, corresponding with the Jagat says, and this really confirmed his sort of paranoia that you know people were conspiring against. So he he made sure he got rid of them as well. So people that had really helped him, uh, financed him, supported him militarily. Uh, Mir Qasim was just killing them one by one. Um, and then he wrote, uh, he, but with, sort of covered with despair, he wrote to Warren Hastings um, for permission to return to his home and half with a view to proceeding finally on a pilgrimage to holy shrines. In other words, to retire from office and to go for Hajj to Makkah. So he said, look, I've had enough. 
with all of this as well. And Hastings was sympathetic um, to the situation which 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 had led him to indulge in such savagery. Um, but he he realized that this person was too much um, covered in blood now, um, and so um, that when Mir Qasim realized that even Hastings can't help him anymore for what he's done, um, he played his last uh, trump card. Mir Qasim played his last trump card. So this was an emperor or a nawab really on his last legs. Um, he wrote to someone called Major Adams, uh, where he questioned the legitimacy of the company, uh, and he made one final threat. Um, uh, basically saying, you know, if you guys don't sort yourselves out, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with you guys. Um, Adam sent a response to him uh, with an ultimatum uh, because he'd captured all the prisoners, right? Um, I forgot to mention, but in the battles, in one of the battles, he'd captured a lot of British or English uh, soldiers. And so he'd said, look, if you don't, if you don't stop doing what you're doing, I'm going to kill all these soldiers I've captured from the English. And so an interesting... Um, Exchange takes place, and I want to spend some time just going through this because I think it's important. So Adam sends a brief response uh, with an ultimatum that even if one hair on the heads of the prisoners is hurt, uh, you will have no title to mercy from the English. Uh, in other words, we'll come for you, um, and that uh, we will we will pursue you. Uh, we won't leave you if you kill any of these people. Um, and so uh, this reply of Mir Qasim reached. Uh, sorry, this reply of Adam reached Mir Qasim. And they had a discussion um, and he called uh, one of his people called Gentile and he said, look, what should we do? Right. What should we do? And he basically said, look, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't kill. I wouldn't kill any of these people. I wouldn't kill the prisoners. Right. I wouldn't mess with English. They, they have superior power now and I wouldn't do this. Um, um, but Mir Qasim had already resolved, I guess, in some ways to um, to kill the prisoners. Um, he said, you know, for example, that if I fell, if I fall into hands of the English, they would not spare me. They'd have me killed. Right? They're going to kill me anyway. Once they get hold of me, they're going to kill me anyway. Uh, but he was like, no, 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 they're not going to do that. They'll, they'll probably take care of you. You're a nawab. You're a person of nobility, and they wouldn't do that to you as well. Um, so he says himself that I left. Uh, Gentil says I left with this discussion with uh, Mir Qasim to try and convince him that you don't kill. Don't 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 fulfill this sort of agreement of where you're going to say you're going to kill uh, English soldiers that you've captured, uh, and then uh, um, uh, he got somebody else in to come into the room. He got rid of Gentile, and somebody else came in the room, and he said, you know, um, like kill all these people, like kill all these all these uh, soldiers that we have. Um, so, uh, so in Sumru, one of his uh, soldiers, uh, uh, army men, he basically began firing into the crowd of these prisoners and he killed basically. There was some resistance, um, but 45 company servants perished in what came to be known as the British, uh, come to be known as the Patna Massacre. So he, Mir Qasim really um, dug his grave now. You know, this is really the final act for him. Uh, um, and so... This is what happened. Now, Mir Qasim had also at the same time, while he was worried about his life and done this strange, bizarre act of killing company servants, uh, he'd also sent messages to uh, Shujaru Dola, who we talked about before, uh, who is now the Nawab of, who's the Nawab of Awaz, Awaz uh, and Shah Alam as well, uh, who was staying with him as a guest. So there's three of them now. There's uh, Mir Qasim, Shujaru Dola, and then there's Shah Alam as well. And they basically come together to make an alliance to um, as, as a Mughal alliance against the company as well. Okay. Now, there's one person there when they were making this alliance um, uh, uh, who was like, look, it's not a good idea fighting the British. Like, your, your army is not well trained. They are very well trained. And it's not a good idea to fight against this, um, uh, this, this company. Um, so this is... Um, I guess Shujaru Dola, Shah Alam, and Mir Qasim were very ambitious at this stage. They felt that they could, as as a, as a as a as a group of three people, three leaders, they could take back from the British. Now, Shujaru Dola is very interesting because remember he was the son of the uh, Mughal vizier Safdar Jung, and uh, he was a giant man. Um, he's described in very very much great detail. Um, and Shujaru Dola, right? Shuja liked this idea of a grand Mughal alliance against the company, okay? Um, and 
he had no doubt that if he'd exiled Nawab of Bengal and the Emperor Shah Alam were to unite their forces, resources and authority, they could, as he told, startle peace envoys from the company shortly afterwards, easily reconquer Bengal and expel the English uh, whenever the English come to uh, come to court as humble petitioners. His, ma his majesty may, may choose to assign them a suitable outpost from where, from where they may trade. Otherwise, my sword will answer your proposal. So they, he was quite confident that he would be able to defeat the company. Um, the emperor, who was his guest, basically, who'd kept him with him, uh, Shah Alam was very, I mean, throughout this battle, um, which we we'll, should cover now, he was, he was less certain. Um, the company had also, remember, given, uh, sworn to him his fealty. So he'd, he'd had aligned, he'd had some sort of um, a warm warmness towards the company as well. And he saw it the company as an imperial ally. So while uh, Mir Qasim and Shujad Dawla were ambitious and they felt this was a good thing to do, Shah Alam, the third person in this sort of Mughal alliance, was less certain. Hmm. And so the final, in any case, the three armies came together. Um, around 150,000 strong army was gathered against uh, from the Mughal Empire. Um, he, Shah Alam, throughout this whole uh, uh, attempt to take back India from the English was very, 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 very uh, uncertain. And um, so he felt that his company machine, this uh, the, the, the emperor, the empire was not going to be successful at all in terms of taking back um, um, from the company as well. And so he was not alone. For example, there's a, there's a very nice narration on page 191. Where in a, an early prasuja to the emperor and Mir Qasim to meet the most celebrated poet of the age, Sheikh Muhammad Ali Hazin, in Benares, where he had settled after surviving two of the great disas disasters of his age, the terrible sacking of Isfahan by Afghans in 1722, and then the, and then that of Delhi by Nader Shah in 1739. He was very old Sheikh now, um, 72, and was revealed by all. So these these people decided to visit him, maybe to get blessings and to see what he had to say. So when the poet saint asked Shuja Dudola what the purpose was of his visit, the Nawab vizier booned, I finally decided to make war on the infidel Christians and with God's help will sweep them out of Hindustan. Shuja expected to be congratulated by the poet, uh, but the grey-bearded sheikh merely smiled and said, with untrained troops like yours, who most ha mostly haven't learned how to unsheath their swords or handle a shield properly, who have never seen the face of a war close-up on a modern battlefield where human bodies bodies scatter, shatter and fall with their lives blown out, you intend to co confront the most experienced and disciplined army this country has ever seen. You ask my advice? I tell you it is a shameful folly and it is hopeful to ex it is hopeless to expect victory. This is what the Sheikh is telling them. The Firangis are past masters at strategy. Only if unity and discipline entirely collapses amongst them will you have any chance of victory. This is what the Sheikh had to say to them in terms of their sort of ambitious hubris of taking back from the company. This was Sheikh Muhammad Ali Hazin. Um, and so this was the advice that they gave. Um, eventually the battle took place. Um, it, it goes into detail about what happened. Um, and um, eventually they were defeated, right? Um, um, so Mir Qasim, for example, who had been one of the richest, most powerful rulers in India became um, became to become Shuja's shackle and penniless prisoner. So this is what happened as well. Um, remember, Shuja Dudala was very, very clever. So when, when they were defeated, Shuja Dudala basically managed to strike a deal. Uh, he betrayed uh, his partners, basically. Uh, and so, um, so, for example, in June 1764, after weeks of steady losses and no gains. Um, as unknown, unknown to Shuja's Mughals, supplies were beginning to run out in the city and battered. And, um, and so they were they were basically, um, Shuja was tired of, of fighting with them. So, um, so he decided that he would, uh, he would turn against his ally, ally Mir, Mir Qasim, um, and who he basically said that it was his fault that they were defeated. So he basically turned against Mir Qasim because he felt that a defeat at this battle uh, was to do with him. And so um, Mir Qasim was 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 basically handed over to Shuja Dawla and he became his prisoner. Okay. Um, 
So four months later, on the 22nd of October, uh, the, the, to the beat of regimental drums, the Red Court or the first battalions of company sepoys could be seen marching along the banks of Ganges through a succession of mango groves, closing in on Boxer. Boxer is where the battle, next battle took place. So Boxer is a place that you can look up on Google um, and you'll find that this was another important battle be, besides afterwards the battle of Plassey as well. Okay. Um, and a single regiment had arrived from fresh from Cal, commanded by one of the most effective British officers in India, in India, um, in, in India, a dashing, cool-headed, but utterly ruthless 38-year-old Scottish Highlander named Major, uh, named Major Hector Munro. So he'd come to help as well. And at the battle that took place, the famous battle of Buxar, they were defeated. Um, and so this is what happened as well. Um, the company enriched themselves again. Um, and so even uh, Shuja Daula, even Mir uh, Qasim, all of these people were now truly, truly humiliated as a company began to really uh, take control, okay? Um, so Buxar was short and a confused battle, but a bloody one. The company lost 850 people, wounding or missing. And of the 70,000 men they brought to the field, more than an eight of, eight of their total. Mughal losses were many times higher, perhaps as many as 5,000 dead. Uh, for a long time, the outcome was uncertain, but for all of this, it was still ultimately one of the most decisive battles in Indian history, the Battle of Buxar, even more so than the famous Battle of Plassey seven years earlier. The three great armies would, would have to come to, would, of the world, Mughal world, had come together to defeat the company and expel it from India, but instead it was the Mughals that were defeated. The company was left the dominant military force in East, North East India. Buxar, the battle, confirmed the company's control of Bengal, and the course and opened the way for them to extend their influence uh, to the West. Okay, The company, which has started off as an enterprise dominated by privateers and former Caribbean pirates, had already transformed itself itself once into a relatively respectable international trading co corporation with a share price so reliable its stock was regarded as almost as a form of international currency. You can see the influence and the power of the company. Now the company was transformed a second time, not just as a vehicle of trade, operating from a scattering of Indian coastal enclaves, but as the ruler of a rich, expansive territorial empire extending across South Asia. For this, above all, was the moment this corporate trading organization succeeded in laying the ground for its territorial conquest of India. A business enterprise had now emerged from its chrysalis, transformed into an autonomous imperial power backed by a vast army. Okay, So lots of things happen that allow this company to become um, as big as it had done as well. Okay, um, so they suffered different fates. Um, I want to quickly talk about what happened to Mir Qasim. So um, Mir Qasim was freed by Shuja later on from his imprisonment, but stripped both of his power and misfortune, and he he, he basically lost out what he had as well. Uh, Shuja the Dora, uh, Shuja Shah Alam as well. Um, he did his best, as you know, to patch up relationships with the company. Um, and he'd had, obviously, secret correspondence with the company. So he'd been talking to the company privately. Um, um, so he, he, he shortly after Boxer Shuja and his army fled into it. Okay. Shah Alam played a deft hand and deciding that he was much more useful to the company as an ally than an enemy. So he, he basically became useful to the company. Um, so Munro, who came over from uh, England, was well aware that a puppet Shah Alam could give the company's expansionist ambitions um, uh, Shah Alam gave the company the expansive ambition in terms of Mughal seal of legitimacy. So Shah Alam could be used as a puppet to give legitimacy to the company as well. Uh, so um, he'd, he'd moved, so they'd used him. Um, he'd give a magnificent Mughal fort, um, which was built by his ancestor Akbar uh, near the Yamuna, Yamuna and Ganges River. Um, and then he waited there for the arrival of someone very, very important for the third time, which I'm going to talk about in the next lecture. So I'm going to split this chapter up a little bit more. Uh, so in the next lecture, I'll talk about the next person, the next chap next discussion is chapter. So what happens is Shah Alam then comes to meet someone very, very important, who is the figure of Robert Clive. So Robert Clive will now come to India for the third time, um, who's, who, who was successful in the Battle of Plassey, right? The Baron of uh, he's basically called the Baron of Plassey. So we'll talk about Robert Clive in the next lecture, um, and we'll move on from there as well. Hope you found that useful. As always, any questions you can ask. I'll see you then. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.